Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Excited to talk to you about e-commerce. <laughs> Me too. We've got about 60 seconds till everyone joins us. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So should we just kind of get started and I guess we should wait till 1030, shouldn't we? <laughs> I'm just excited. Yeah, me too. Okay, we're 1030 on the dot now. So let's let's kind of get started and see who starts to join us. So um, do we want to do you want to just kick off by introducing yourself and then we'll kind of talk about how we met and all that? Absolutely. Well, welcome everyone that is attending our marketing for e-commerce brands live session. Um, my name is Diana Ray Pine. I am the owner of Palm and Pine Marketing and Design, and I also work for Renaissance Marketing um, as a digital marketing manager or associate. Um, they focus on SEO and being a full stack digital marketing firm for larger organizations. Um, my business is surrounded by or focuses on social media management strat and strategy and brand design. Um, and I work with a variety of e-commerce brands, which is why we're discussing that today. Um, and then Grace, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, awesome. So I am Grace Clemens, a marketing lead of 13 years. I'm originally from Boston, but moved overseas about 14 years ago, got my degree in business management with a focus in digital marketing and consumer psychology at Queen Mary of London, went right into B2B marketing for a few years. Um, with a, a little bit of freelancing here and there. And then I went into the fashion marketing industry for four years, working for Silk Fred. Then I went freelance for a few years, got picked up by XPRIZE, a nonprofit organization, and managed one of my largest projects to date, the $100 million XPRIZE carbon removal project, uh, sponsored by Elon Musk. And then I went into SaaS for a year and was the marketing manager of a SaaS company. And now, fast forward to today, 13 years later, I am freelance again, currently specialing in digital marketing audits for e-commerce brands. So we'll touch upon that a little bit today. And then keep your eyes peeled for my marketing agency, which will be launching soon. So that's everything for me. Yay. So fun fact, Grace and I have known each other for about three years now. And we met each other because... I was hosting a marketing book club and I posted in the women in marketing Facebook group page. I think that's how we met or the digital nomad page because as Grace is a traveler, I lived in a tiny home for three years and traveled the East Coast. <laughs> and over the three years, we would just catch up and talk about marketing here and there. And yeah, it's been pretty cool. I'm glad to know her. <laughs> Yeah, me too. It's just so crazy how the internet can really, you know, connect you with people that you wouldn't have otherwise met. And I really enjoyed networking in general, but it's really yeah. great to see kind of how our, you know, professional and personal relationship has blossomed. I actually dug out the book club notes because I wanted to remember what book it was. And it was Magnetic Marketing. That is what we were. I we were, Kennedy, right? Yeah, we were reading. <laughs> Which, if I remember correctly, we both enjoyed the book, but we felt like we could maybe even give it some spice. So yes, that's what we'll we'll, we'll talk a little <laughs> bit more about today. So one of our first topics that we wanted to cover is where e-commerce business owners go wrong. Do you want to start us off with that one? Yeah, absolutely. I think we can kind of go over every aspect of marketing and how an e-commerce brand should start and kind of position themselves. Um, I think one of the first things that e-commerce brands, especially if you're a solo or small team working to put this all together, is when you choose your platform and design your actual website, it's so important that it has a responsive design and it's based around the user experience. So you can't just focus on, okay, I want this to look beautiful and this is my business. You have to focus on this is, I'm the customer, I'm on this website, what am I doing to purchase? The product or service that you're selling and I think that's where a lot of people mess up at the very beginning you know what I mean 
A hundred percent. And that responsiveness, I mean, you always want to be keeping an eye on your bounce rate. And I've seen some very, you know, well-funded companies have some really high bounce rates and it all came down to the UX and the UI. So I think that's a really strong point that you've made that, you know, understanding that you're your customer's experience from the beginning to the end is going to make a big difference. And that website functionality is huge. I would go off of that and say that doing a budget is like the number one thing that e-commerce brands should absolutely be doing is creating your budget before you create the strategy and somewhere along in there have some data analysis going on about, I think that depends on where the brand is at. If you're a smaller brand, you're still going to be the testing phase. Whereas if you're a larger brand and you've been doing this, you know, for years, you're going to be having much more data analysis. But as we know, as freelancers, the first question we ask is what is your budget? And I think as a brand, it's super, super important to know where your spending is going to go before you start allocating that budget. So uh, general rule of thumb for me is 20% of your de- desired total revenue should be allocated to marketing and 10% of that should go towards PPC. That is in an ideal world. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, you know, again, how far you go into that budgeting, if you're a brand new startup, it's going to look a little different. Um, in terms of targets and how much you do actually invest into PPC off the bat. Whereas if you're a more well-established e-commerce brand, you're going to have a much more clear idea of how much revenue came in the year before and, and where you're going to be going next year. So I think budgeting is, is my uh, number one tip. And then obviously strategy after that. Certainly. I think budget's very important, especially if you reach out to freelancers as ourselves or other marketing agencies, if you come with a budget and you know exactly what you want and need, that's a green flag for us. We know you're going to be easy to work with because that shows that you're experienced, you know what you're doing, and you know what you need to outsource. Agreed. And I think also this even applies to so much more. If you're collaborating with people, if you're working with influencers, you know, a lot of the audits that I've done for e-commerce brands include setting goals and benchmarks for where we want to go in the next three to six months or the next quarter. And where that budget has really come in is it allows you to set realistic goals because you can say, okay, I know I only have 8K for the next four months to put in influencers. Okay, so that will allow me to get a goal of four influencers if I'm paying them 2K each. So I think it goes, it really trickles into everything and just allows you to strategize in such a more clear way. Definitely. Yeah. And the next thing we wanted to kind of touch upon is how to choose what platform to invest your time and your resources in. This is a super great question that I love to debate. And I think, Diana, do you want to just kind of talk about how we chose to do the live where we did today? Yeah, absolutely. So we hopped on a brainstorming call and we thought about who we're targeting as digital marketing consultants. And obviously, B2B, LinkedIn popped in their heads. And then during their free time, during the middle of the week, because that's usually when you're kind of taking a break, I hop on LinkedIn all the time in between my lunch period. So that's why we chose 1230 Eastern time on LinkedIn. Um, I think if we had to debate our second platform that we would choose, what would you choose and why? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I, I'm between Instagram and TikTok. For me personally, Instagram, I get higher engagement. Um, uh-huh. I haven't gone viral on TikTok yet. I just see more engagement. However... I know the capability of TikTok. Like I know it would be very possible because I follow, you know, PR specialists on there and digital marketers on there. Um, So I would be between Instagram and TikTok, but if I had to choose right now because of engagement, I would go for Instagram. Okay. Uh, I would actually think I would probably choose Facebook just because it is my highest lead generation or yeah, my highest lead generator organically without any ad spend. I get most of my leads through Facebook. Interesting. I, yeah. I should have, I guess I kind of overlooked Facebook, but I it's guess. It's so easy to overlook. But if yeah. you think about the age range, I think Facebook would be my second cho- or choice. And 
it makes sense because there is a lot of marketing groups on there. So, um, but you can see, I think looking at from the e-commerce brand stand of what point of view of Definitely. that's how we chose what platform, what, how do you, how does an e-commerce brand choose what platform? Do you want to kick that off and then I'll, and then I'll follow up. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think knowing your target audience and demographic is very important. One of the brands I work with, we know that most of their customers and target audience are between ages of 18 and 40 years old and primarily females. It's a female clothing brand um, and it's an online boutique. So we have the platforms as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, which is where those demographics mainly are. <laughs> yeah. I think also something I would recommend to, you know, all brands is having a brand persona guideline, whether yes, that's an on its, yeah, an avatar, whether that's on its own, just having a brand persona deck or working that into your brand Bible, I think is super helpful. Understanding who you're going to want to reach and just going for it. I think that's the biggest thing is like the only way you're going to find out is by trying. If you already know, based on your engagement and your data, that your customers are most engaged on Instagram or TikTok, then that's going to be your answer. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're just starting off, you know, this is our first live, you just got to go for it with your best judgment and, and understand where your audience is right now. So for B2B, LinkedIn is a given. Um, I don't think people should overlook YouTube. I often encourage people to do a kind of a trickle down content format. If they're say filming a podcast, like a video style, they can trickle that down. Um, so don't overlook YouTube either, but I think it's just, it's almost pure logic about what time is my audience most in the mood to go on social media or LinkedIn, you know, yeah. just really putting yourself in the shoes of the audience and then testing it, seeing if it works and seeing what the data says. Absolutely. I have a question. Do you ever think about your own, like, user data like how much time you spend on your phone and which platforms and you're like wow i'm such a customer for this <laughs> like i know i look at tiktok at nighttime like when i'm in bed I'll, I'll, i'm a scroller it's terrible but i do it and during the day because i manage socials i'm on instagram and facebook like, all the time <laughs> yeah that's actually a really great point that i never really thought about for myself i would say instagram twitter are my daytimes TikToks mm -hmm. are my nighttime. Same thing. I love to scroll and decompress before bed. Um, I try to switch to a book. And Facebook is kind of like just where I check in either to respond to messages, comments, or Facebook groups, like our marketing groups and stuff. Um, so yeah, that would be my Pinterest. I still touch upon a little bit. I have not dabbled with threads. Um, but that's, I did the that's, first week or like the first three days, but I never touched it. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm resistant, but I have been reading, you know, that there's rumors that they're still trying to push it. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, and, and I think I saw some rumors about TikTok actually developing a photo app in com on competition of Instagram. Oh, wow. I, because it, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is something e-commerce brands might like to know is that, on TikTok now, a lot of photos, the swipe photos are the carousels. Yeah, the carousels. They're they're performing really, really, really well. And I actually quite like this form of content. But as a user, I would like to see videos still in a balance. Because have that's... you seen the whiskey neat trend? <laughs> no, what's that one? I think it's a hosier song. It's like I like my whiskey neat, and it's two like before and after photos. No, I haven't seen that you one. You guys can pick up one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so should we kind of crack on and just discuss real life examples for e-commerce brands? Sure. I did want to mention, well, I guess we could go down the rabbit hole. So in a, we covered, you covered pay-per-click and ad spend in a budget. We talked about the website. We talked about choosing social platforms. I think another thing we should mention is email marketing. I think that's very important for e-commerce e -commerce brands. I'm sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I touch upon email marketing quite a lot um, in terms of, I mean, I've been an email marketer and I've run campaigns, but over the years, I have worked it into my audits where I've helped e-commerce brands such as, you know, supplement companies, 
um, is a good example where we increased average checkout by I think 240, 270%. And all it was, was we did an audit and looking at the data within all of the social and then also within the emails that she had been sending, we pinpointed that the design and the coloring needed a whole re rework. So they mm -hmm. had they had done a rebrand and we had experimented with some col colors. And basically through that audit, I suggested like, look, we're gonna redo the template this way. We're gonna redo the email strategy. We're gonna send four emails a month and they're gonna be X, Y, Z. And we saw an immediate, immediate increase in revenue. I mean, it was it was outstanding. And also introducing things like back in stock. If you are an e-commerce brand and you are not yes. doing back in stock emails, get on it, please. Because that is one of the highest revenue drivers years I've seen this as a marketer. Anything you want to add on that? Definitely. I, go and I mean, and then, yeah, no, you're good. I think the standard um, automations that they should have in place as well, you know, abandoned cart, your welcome newsletter, your standard sales trickle down afterwards for nurturing. Um, and then, yeah, sales, special sales campaigns that you were doing. Um, I think e-commerce brands, some of them can also enroll in SMS, um, marketing. Um, I personally like to caution on that just because you don't want to be too spammy and then you're wasting marketing dollars on that for people to unsubscribe. So if it's like a exclusive alert type of thing, I think it works. Um, especially for those brands who do like live streams of their new releases and stuff. Yeah, I think SMS is a really good one to touch upon because I know like Clavio and a lot of email marketing platforms now are now integrating SMS and I'm all for it, but I completely agree with you. I think be very, very gentle and very clear on what your objective is when you're texting somebody. I have received SMS from companies, I think it was like actually a coach or something where I almost actually, I didn't, but I almost did. And those SMSs were too, at first they weren't invasive and they were timed well, but eventually it did become spammy. And I was like, I, this is too much, I don't want it. So yeah. I think that's definitely something to be aware of, like absolutely invest in SMS, but be super clear on your objective and what you're trying to do with your customers with those SMS, because it is a little bit more intimate. You're in their actual phone. Um, I would also add UPM tracking is so yeah. important. <laughs> I have seen this. This is why I love Clavio specifically because they allowed us to name our campaigns, do our segmenting. No, no manual UTM tracking. That is the dream. We want it automated, right? I have also worked with platforms. I think it was Active Campaign that made us manually enter all UTM links. <laughs> and let me tell you, it drove me insane. So I think, you know, definitely researching the UTM tracking, how it works before you invest in a platform is super wise because if you can just, you know, organize your campaign names by a certain UTM tracking style that you have in place, then you don't have to worry about it and it's all super organized and that makes makes the audits and the data analysis much easier in the long run. I completely agree. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, just because it's already almost 12.50, wow. <laughs> um, uh, with my brand that I'm working with, I found about, out about the Google Merchant Center. So if you're an e-commerce brand, and this is an online retailer or a brick or mortar, brick, eh, brick and mortar, <laughs> I encourage you guys to go to Google Merchant Center and create a profile. It's absolutely free, and it's how your product listings can show up in Google search, Google shopping, YouTube, and Google maps. And I believe one more for free. And then you can also connect your Google ads account to it. Um, but yeah, it's very beneficial. I did it with one of the brands I'm working with and she already received like 25 clicks within a day. So nice. if it's free, you should do it. <laughs> yes, we love this. New updates that are good to know. I would kind of merge from what you just touched upon with the brick and mortar shops, because I think what we wanted to touch upon was UGC later on and how e-commerce brands yes. can utilize that. And something that came to my mind is if you are a brick and mortar store and you 
want to merge the experience, I think that's a big opportunity. This is something we've seen really big brands like Burberry was doing this quite a while ago where they were making interactive, you know, you could use your mobile phone in the store. So it was like mm -hmm. connecting the two worlds. And I think that's super valuable for anyone that does have a brick and mortar store. Um, how can you link the two? So if they leave your store later on, how can you ensure that that e-commerce experience merges? And also just giving an actual brand experience. I believe if I remember correctly, Burberry's experience was something about creating perfume and the whole experience in the store took the user through this whole process and it involved using their phone as well. So that mobile to desktop to real life and making sure the brand matches across all, all three. Yes, that's very important. Also another fun update, in the Google universe that I recently found out about was that you can now add all of your social links to your Google business profile. So if you haven't done that yet, I totally recommend going to that and adding them all there. And that probably helps with SEO as well, I'm imagining. Yes. Yay, Google, bringing us the good. <laughs> um, so is there, sorry, is there anything you else you wanna add about Google before we go back into UGC? No, we can go to UGC. Those were my two Google announcements. <laughs> okay, apologies. I didn't mean to skip over the second one. Um, okay, so for UGC, I think one that I would highlight, which I'm surprised not everybody knows about, is the Stanley Cup and how that came to be so famous. I feel like marketers know how that came to be so famous. So do you want to explain? I hope I'm right about this, but does it have to involve a vehicle fire? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> and I saw the original TikTok when it went viral and it started at like 1.4 million views and then went even more viral. Um, oh. It didn't It didn't beat the chocolate covered strawberries on TikTok. Those are still the most liked and viewed photo of all, uh, video of all time. But Stanley Cup, this woman had been in a really, really bad car accident. Thankfully, she was okay, but her entire car had exploded, burnt on fire. And she just filmed this video of her going to, you know, when you have an, an accident, you go to the, the place where it's kept and you just pick up your belongings. And thankfully she was okay. Uh, her car was not. So she heard the TikTok was just her opening her car door. And she's like, guys, I was in a car accident. Look at what the only thing is that survived. And she picks up her Stanley cup. And not only is it in mint condition, it has ice in it. Like she jiggles, <laughs> she, she jiggles it and it has ice in it. And this is after a Stanley cup was in a car fire. Like it was in a bomb and it still had ice. So, I mean, that now it's an interesting one because it, it was not planned. It was just organic. And that, that is a hundred percent, a hundred percent the reason that the Stanley cup is so it's, you know, the, cup of the yeah. <laughs> So, Could you imagine even, being their marketing team and seeing that video? Yes. Well, the CEO, <laughs> the CEO of Stanley Cup bought her a new car to say thank you. Yay. So That's we love, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> that is also a great example of how you should behave as a brand when somebody does free marketing like that for you. I think that's the thing about UTC is you do want to reward your, your customers. If they, yeah. So, I mean, we were all blown away by that, um, that gesture by the CEO. And I think he was completely right in doing that. I mean, when you look at the revenue from Stanley Cups compared to the cost of a car, I think, I think that was a fair trade-off for them. So. <laughs> for sure I would I would add that do we want to talk about? the thing about UGC is like you can always encourage UGC but Stanley Cup is a good example because that was so organic it wasn't it wasn't sponsored it wasn't paid for it was genuine and to be honest that is the best kind of marketing so I think making sure that you're listening on social, if you have listening tools, that's a good way to find not your your asked for UGC, but your organic UGC. So content that people are just talking about you and creating it about you. Make sure that you're out there and you're finding it, and that you can able you you're able to listen to it. And at the very least, that you're very least that you're just engaging with it. So you know, I think having UGC worked into your strategy as yes, asking people to create it, giving them 
a CTA to create it whether after they purchase, purchase a product, like sending them a, you know, hey, you have this product for 10 days, send us a video and give us a review and we'll we'll do X, Y, Z. You'll get 10% off your next order or something. That's all fine and dandy. That's great. Work that into your strategy, but also work the listening into it so you can engage and really capitalize on those UGC opportunities that are out there. I totally agree with that. And I think another thing is when you engage, leave comments. Like if you go on TikTok and you see those videos and you see random brands commenting, it's usually hilarious. Um, what, what did I want to spotlight? Have you seen the Nutter Butter Instagram account? I don't think so, but I'm loving what? our algorithm <laughs> difference here. I, it's not that related, but it's just something that's completely off the wall. I encourage everyone after this, if you have not seen it, go to Instagram and look up Nutter Butter. And then I want you to message me and tell me what you think. <laughs> I will absolutely be doing that after this call. <laughs> oh. Well, um, do we want to kind of, we've got five minutes left. Um, I know that I definitely, we can kind of close things out by just, you know, talking about our offerings right now, but do we want to touch upon any final kind of topics, anything about strategies, strategies for oh, boosting conversion um, rates could be one. I think something about socials that we didn't really mention is that video is king right now. So I would definitely focus on your video content. Um, you can take long format videos and repurpose them into shorts. And like Grace said, start spreading them across multiple platforms and then use the data to see what's working best. And then tri like trickle down and focus on maybe one or two platforms and grow your audience there before trying to spread yourself thin and doing all the platforms at once. Unless you can afford a tool that does them all. Yeah, if you've got the time to speak the language of each platform, brilliant. But most yeah. most small startups do not. Um, I also think that's that I would add because it is it is the video era. Photos are mm -hmm. out the door. The number one thing that I see e-commerce brands do incorrectly is relying on graphics. And I think that would be my biggest thing is look at your content strategy, look at your content batching and say, how can we not depend on graphics? Graphics are okay once in a while, but they have to be good and they have to have value. If it doesn't have value and purpose, Instagram especially is not a place for graphics and nor is TikTok. Is it a, it's a place for inspiration, creativity. And, mm -hmm. and if it's not inspiring, educating or engaging people, entertaining people, then it doesn't belong on there. And most times graphics do not do this. Yes. And I think it's all about being authentic. Nobody wants the scripted, you know, rehearsed over and over again videos. They want to, they want the raw format. They want you out here just speaking like we are today, telling you what we think. <laughs> I don't know. That's my opinion. I and think that's true. And that's back to the Stanley Cup. That is why it did so well. It's because it was, it, was a, it was a great product and it was, it was so genuine and you cannot fake authenticity. You can't. Not in everyday life, not in professional life. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then back to graphics. Um, I think that's another thing where e-commerce brands can go wrong on their website is that they're not investing in proper product photography. If you ha don't have a great background and it looks like it's choppy or you DIY'd it, that lowers your authenticity or yeah, lowers your authority as a website and could prevent someone from purchasing. So that's another thing to check in on. I just did a photo shoot for myself this year and I'm going to do that every year. And I would say if you're not an e-commerce brand that is in the fashion world that does photo shoots religiously, like the, the brands that have a content team and know that's just part of it is they're, they don't have to worry about it as much. Um, whereas the ones that don't, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna be a little bit more important. Um, but yeah, so We've, we've got a couple more minutes left. So do you just want to kind of close out by, is there anything that you want to leave everybody with? It, where can they find you? Where can they find us? How do we work together also? We'll explain that. Absolutely. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram. 
Um, my personal LinkedIn is Diana Rapine, which should be attached to this event page. Um, and then on Instagram, it's Palm Pine Marketing Design. You can DM me there or visit my website, which is www.palmpine.design. Um, we are kicking off this month with a new offer, which is a marketing assistance package. It starts at $1,000 per month, and it gives your business a guaranteed 10 to 15 hours to two dedicated marketing assistants, including me. Um, and that can be a variety of different tasks that you assign to us. Awesome. And yes, you can find your LinkedIn attached to this event. And I am currently offering free 15 minute social media audits to anyone who's interested. That is just me delivering you in a meeting with a you know short compact audit of how you can improve your social media presence. If you're interested in getting a deep dive and actually getting some actionable insights that how you can improve your strategy and ROI, I offer a social media audit or a social media and email marketing audit, which includes both. Um, where Diana and I work together is within my audits, I have an executive summary, which summarizes everything, but then at the end is the actionable insights. And that's really where you know, they have the opportunity, they have the choice to implement in-house or through my agency. And that is where Diana and I team up and, you know, we assist with implementation and I have quite a full service team right now to help with anything outside of our boxes. So that is everything. Our first live of ever, but we're going to be yes. doing this. We're going to be doing this once a month, right? We should. Why not? Yeah. And I think we I should do a different topic. And if you're watching this, feel free to comment below what we should talk about next month. Yes, feel free to send any questions, topic requests. We would love to cover it. Thank you so much, Diana. I had so much fun chatting with you as always. Always a pleasure. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye-bye.